Hello and welcome to Rock Paper Swords, the historical action and adventure podcast. My name is Matthew Harfey. And I am Stephen A. McKay. We're both best-selling historical fiction authors and together we chat about all things historical and anything that could fall under the banner of action and adventure in books, film, TV and games. And we also talk about rock music sometimes. That we do. Each episode we're going to cover different aspects of history from the quirky to the almost unbelievable. We'll also talk about writing, not only with each other but also with guest authors. Now cue the theme music. <laughs> Today's episode, we're going to talk about something that makes a difference between someone reading a book after picking it up or opening a sample online and just closing it and putting it back on the shelf. Yes, we're talking about first pages. The first few lines of a novel can grab you and make you want to read on, or they can put a reader off. In action and adventure novels, which by definition are commercial fiction, it's particularly important to get those first paragraphs right. So I did a, a bit of a search about this online and um, I found some interesting quotes. Anna Valdinger, I'm sorry if I pronounced the surname um, incorrectly, but she's the commercial fiction publisher for HarperCollins Australia, says that the first pages are important because commercial fiction readers are looking for both escape and entertainment. It's crucial to show that the book has something to offer right away for crime and thrillers an intriguing mystery set up from the get go. Whatever it is, you need to get the action or the hook working for you fast. So she's talking as a, as a commissioning um, editor, I think. Um, and uh, another thing I found was novelist, um, copy editor and writing coach C.S. Lakin on her website, Live, Write, Thrive, puts it really well. She says, um, readers want to see the scene played out not be told about it with lengthy narrative and explanation. They don't want ordinary and predictable. They want their curiosity aroused and their hearts tugged as quickly as possible. They want to latch on to a character who intrigues them and who's facing challenging circumstances. Writers are encouraged to open scenes in media res. That means your character is dropped into the middle of something that's been developing before the scene starts. So we can talk a bit about that. This is still her quote, not the bit, but me interjecting. But um, going back to her quote, it takes careful, careful thought to come up with a strong opening moment in which to showcase your character. That scenario you put her in needs to convey her personality, core need, an immediate goal slash objective and problem, as well as establish setting, hint at a bigger conflict if possible and or useful to the premise, and perhaps show and describe other characters in the scene. So bearing all of that in mind, you can see it's a very important part of the book. Obviously, people do judge the whole book, not just on the cover, which they do judge books on, but also on the first page or two. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea, seeing the importance of the first page, um, to talk about favourite books of ours, a couple of favourite books of ours, and what the writers of those did in these crucial first lines. Um, and then we'll also dissect a little bit about what we've done in a couple of our own novels and chats about whether writers should include a prologue or not and what our thoughts are on that so as I've done all the talking so far I think I'm going to throw it over to you Stephen hey thanks thanks Matthew finally shut up <laughs> yes, that's going to be a running theme of this um, <laughs> podcast uh, but, uh, just quickly on that people go to Amazon to buy a book a Kindle book uh, I'm going to click on the cover because I like the cover same as Rock fans do, or did anyway, when they would go into the record shop and they would find an amazing cover and they would buy it just for that. So a reader will look for a cover that fits a genre, as we spoke about in the last episode, with the weapons and stuff to tell you which genre it is. But nowadays, Amazon, you can click the look inside button and it immediately opens up to the first page. And if that first page is not very good or doesn't match the cover, they're just not going to buy it. 
So it's very important to get that first page right, and I really dragged the, the reader into the, the story. Yeah, I think it's something that in the past wasn't as important as now in the digital age with people's attention span seems to be so limited. And, and yeah, I know, media. You know we read a lot less, I think probably people spend less time reading and so you need to really grab them and catch them. So what books have you chosen um, to talk about or what, what was the first book you've chosen to talk about? Well, the first book is The Swords of Night and Day by David Gemmell, which is oh, a... David Gemmell, amazing. Fantasy, uh, but it's not we say fantasy don't we but it's kind of historical fantasy if you like historical fiction i think you'll like david Gemmell's it's books. not they're not um high fantasy they do have a few sort of monsters and things in them but mainly yeah. it's people isn't it it's mainly yeah, people it's, fighting other it's people really good characters and heroic characters yeah. and it, it's very similar to historical fiction it's just maybe in a fantasy setting with a little bit of using magic spells and stuff like no that. there's a little bit of sort of mysticism more than spell use isn't there yeah. and and there's every now and again you get something like a you're not sort of dragons and things but they're sort of like no. demons maybe there's sort of things yeah that's particular the, the book nether world bit, and, and even this is kind of more supposed to be scientific where they meld monsters with people mm. and stuff like that um, so so when, was, yeah, it, when so, was it published, The Swords of Night and Day? Because that must be a while ago, because David Gemmell sadly passed away a few years ago. Uh, 2004, Okay, looks like. Uh, yeah, so it's not that old. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Some of our listeners would be going like, that was before I was born. But <laughs> well, to me and you, Matthew, it's not that old. Ain't it? Yeah, it, it seems like it sounds like a new book to me. <clears throat> yeah. It must um, have been one of his later ones, because he, he... Yeah, I think it probably early, was, yeah. Early in 21st century. Didn't he? So do you want me to... Go on, read, read us the first few lines, and then we can dissect well, it Well, there's a, a prologue, but I'm going to skip the prologue. Oh, because... that's really contentious. So you're well, going to skip the prologue, is... yep. even though you think... So do you... So, okay, so this is... We really need to lay down... Yeah, there, there, there will be some discussion about we this. To, we, we definitely need to. So I, I feel great umbrage that you're actually not reading the prologue. If the prologue is before the first lines of the book, the <laughs> prologue are the first lines of the book. I mean, that is the <laughs> that is the first page of the book. Well, you're right. But for the purposes of this podcast, I wanted Ooh. to find something exciting. Okay, so now, okay, so, well, you we're going to take different tack then. Okay, so this is interesting. So go, it go just for it so then. happy. As we said before we started recording, we don't have a lot of physical books in the house these days. So to actually find a physical book that we really like to start off was a bit more difficult. But, this, would have been. but this, this is really interesting, though, because you're saying that having looked at it, you find the introduction to the first chapter after the prologue is more exciting and more gripping, yes. which makes me wonder why... David Gemmell felt the necessity to add the prologue. But we can talk about that maybe yes. after you've read the first few lines that we can read us the first lines first. Let's talk about the, the lines that you're talking about. First, there was darkness, complete and absolute. No sounds to disconcert him, no conscious thoughts to concern him. Then came awareness of darkness and everything changed. He felt a pressure against his back and legs and a gentle thudding in his chest. Fear touched him. Why am I in the dark? In that instant, a bright, powerful image filled his mind. A man snarling with hatred, leaping at him, spear raised. The face disappearing in a spray of crimson as a sword blade half severed the skull. More warriors attacking him. There was no escape. Okay. That's a pretty um, intense few lines. But um, yeah, interesting only things. three paragraphs. So things that, that I note, noticed straight away, and bearing in mind that I don't know what's in that prologue. I've read the book, but it was many, many years ago, so I can't remember what was in the prologue, is I don't know the name of the character, so I don't know who it is. But apart from that, everything else is very descriptive and very immediate, and I, you know, you're really in the moment. It's all about sensations and feelings. Yeah. And it's very visceral. You know, the, a man snarling, leaping, spear raised, a spray of crimson, sword blade half severed the skull. It's very, it's kind of action that's going on, but it's described in quite a, it's a bland way, but a passive way. It's, it's kind of, but it's, but, but, but to me, it feels like it's evoking the emotions of the of the person that's um, that's, that's experiencing that yeah, stuff. Yeah, he's right? thinking he's, about he's it thinking rather about than it. actually. It's not yeah. actually like happening right then, but it's he's like, kind of remembering it. Or like a vision or something, yeah. Yeah. 
So I guess these things, for me, one of the things that, are, that the first lines of a book need to do is kind of open up a question and make you wonder what what's going to happen next. Kind of needs to, for me, it needs to set the scene. You need to know what, if you're talking about historical fiction, um, you need to be, tell me which world we're in, make me feel sort of comfortable that this is a world that you as the reader um, are going to be led into well by the by the by the writer the writer knows what he's talking about um but but that there's a there's questions there there's things i want to know the answers to um and also you know you need to get some sort of connection to a character i guess early on as quickly as possible but well, the first line here is first there was darkness yeah complete and absolute so your first thought there is why is it dark yeah where is he what's well, exactly. going to happen next and, really? and, well and even the question of who is he you know, I mean, as long as as long as you're interested enough to know who you know who, to find out who he is, just out of a matter of interest, because I know you haven't read the prologue, but can you just read the first couple of lines of the prologue yeah. just to give give us an idea of if if I'd opened the book and read the look inside bit, because the prologue would come up, wouldn't it? I mean, some people yeah, skip that's... the prologue. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and I find uh, that amazing that people skip the prologue because I never would skip any part of the introductory think, parts of a book. In my experience. I often find that the prologue is quite boring compared really to the start of the book. It's almost as if the author wrote the book with the first page of the first chapter in mind as being the one to draw readers in, and the prologue was added at the end. Yeah, well, that's really interesting, but I don't know why... Well, I don't know why you would do that. Why would you add a well, prologue? Well, I could maybe, as we go on, okay. I could maybe okay. have a thought on that, but I'll read you the prologue here. It's okay. quite long chapters, uh, Paragraph, sorry, compared to the, the actual okay. book. Okay, we'll just read the first, first paragraph or two then and see. The sun was warm and a blue sky as the priestess Astarte stood at the graveside, watching her aides disguising the tomb. Carefully, they placed rocks upon the small island site and transferred plants to cover the recently turned soil. Astarte pushed back the hood of her scarlet and gold gown, revealing a hairless head and a face of startling, ageless beauty. So it, it's a good paragraph, and it's very evocative. It's us. evocative, but it's descriptive, and we're yeah. not really getting... There's no action, is there? There's nothing happening. Somebody's really, yeah. died or something. Yeah. Well, they have, because it's disguised in the tomb. So Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, because, I mean, I, my own experience, I've got some some of my books have got prologues. I've written prologues in some of my books, but when I have, they're also quite um, immediate. I'm trying to get something you know, exciting in that prologue. I'm not just sort of like recounting recounting some event that that yeah like that, that, seems that, to that be. precedes the the action uh -huh. it's like an event that precedes the action but i still try to make it action-packed and exciting and i know gemmel does that sometimes as well um but i'm just thinking about in the case of the serpent sword which is the first book i ever wrote i actually did write the prologue last funnily enough just like you said yeah. so uh -huh. i've started writing the book at chapter one and i wrote the book and i edited chapter one a lot and obviously got it quite polished but it's not action packed that chapter one is bear brand getting out of a boat traveling you know walking up the the, the to, to the top of bebenberg and entering bebenberg and there's a there's a, a feast going on and he sees some people but it's no, there's no action really and it was when i got to the end of the book i decided there needed to be something to sort of kick off the whole premise of why bear brand had traveled up to um to bebenberg and 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 kind of set a mystery and so i wrote a scene interestingly enough a bit like the introduction that you've um that you've read out there for that book for, D for david gimmel that first not in the first chapter um similarly where i didn't name the character by name so it's left to a to the reader to imagine who it is so um i've actually got it here i might as well i could just read you the first couple of lines just to to, to explain what i'm talking about actually um so the prologue is this is from the prologue but these are the first you know the first words of the book the man stood in the shadows preparing for murder he pulled his cloak about him stretching muscles that had grown stiff from inactivity it was cold and his breath steamed in the autumn night air it was uncomfortable but he was he was he would wait his mind was made up his suspicions had been aroused before but now he knew the truth of it he had followed them here had seen them go inside together and so straight away from that first line you know that there's going to be a murder something's coming isn't it action yeah and then That's it goes really on good. and i go on thank you <laughs> then he goes on to describe you know how he how he murders someone and you you're not you're left not knowing who that person is so when bear brand arrives you find out who was murdered and for most of the book you don't know who murdered him i think i know 
I think you might know now, but um, you probably... It's funny because you're reading that out and it's kind of... I've not read it in, what is it, eight years or something? It's coming it's come right back to me. Wow. It's an excellent opening. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm very pleased with that one, but it's funny because it is it's it's cast as a prologue, but because it is different characters. I didn't call it chapter one because it's not Bear Brand who's the main character. But I still wanted it to last? be. I wrote that last. That was written the last thing I wrote of the first draft. Yeah, of the sort of final first draft and whatever. One of my Forest Lord books has got a prologue, uh, Rise of the Wolf, uh, and I really liked the uh, the start of that book. In fact. I was going to talk about it today as the my choice, but it's actually got a prologue, and like you, it was actually written last. And I remember, I don't remember exact circumstances, but it never had a prologue. And my editor said to me, "You need to explain this certain okay. thing that happens in the book." And I thought, "Well, how am I going to do that without changing things?" So I just made it a prologue. But like you, I tried to make it action packed. There's people getting shot with arrows and stuff. It's an exciting scene. Have you have you got it there to read the first few uh, lines of that? No, because I was going to <laughs> do a different <laughs> book. Uh, hang on a sec, then. I've trapped you. Okay, so this is Rise of the Wolf. This is the one that I was going to pick as my favourite because it, it sticks in my mind. So this is actual chapter one. I'll do the same as I did with the David Gale. No, no, no. This, read, 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 read the prologue now. I need you to, to, I need oh, to, right, okay. I need to hear the prologue. Compare, let's compare prologue. So this was this written. Point. I'm sure it was written last just to explain some things that happened in the book. The two girls smiled at one another as they pushed their way through the sparse late winter foliage and caught sight of the snares they'd set the day before. One of the traps had managed to catch a hare in mid-hop and its little brown body hung, dead and ready for the pot. Well done, Matilda said, clapping her younger friend in the back. That was one of your snares. He you set it just at the right height and now, she glanced down at her own empty hands, we have at least something to contribute to dinner tonight. So it's kind of, that's the scene as the two girls are going round there and uh, they meet some bad men <clears throat> and some trouble happens. As is, as tends to happen. So I assume, I don't actually remember it that well, but I assume this is setting up the the bad guy. This is where he comes in. Uh, but the actual chapter one, starts okay. like starts like this and I was really proud of this at the time I remember thinking this oh this is really good and this will really draw readers in especially if, like, this is the third book in the series so everybody knew the characters you've got Will Scarlet and Little John so he's got me Will gutted me like a fish I'm done for Little John fell to the ground clutching his midriff bearded face twisting in pain as he looked up in despair at his companion avenge me Will Scarlet cried out, racing over to his giant friend's side, weapon held aloft, ready to fend off any more blows. Their attacker laughed, and the outlaws shrank back, begging for mercy, their faces twisted in fear. Arthur, what are those two doing with you? Matilda Hood strode into the neatly tended garden with its bright daffodils and snowdrops and scooped up her smiling infant. The boy waved a tiny wooden sword gleefully, almost hitting his mother in the face. That's enough of that game, she scolded John and Will, who shrugged innocently and grinned at the baby when Matilda turned away. Robin, will you tell these two? I don't want Arthur growing up to be a fighter. Nice. So there was certain mm. people that would message me on Facebook and they read the first line thinking that, you know, you'd little killed, John was, You'd killed little John, yeah. He was dead, that was him killed off, which obviously some, some characters die in all our books. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. A lot of people thought that that was that little John was done for at the very first line. And that's very, very good. No, it's really good because it really, you know, as you say, it's, like, it's it's one of those literary tricks that you do by by starting. Like we talked about in media res, starting in the middle of a scene, yeah, and not giving the backstory. Of course, nobody's got the context. So as the reader, you're thrown in, and by not having the context, you can you can um, misguide the reader momentarily which is which is great i've done that a few times not specifically in the start of a book like that but i've done other places in books where you can misread you can mislead the, the reader to think that you're talking about one character but you're talking yeah, about yeah. another some... by the way you start yeah. like a, you start a chapter and you sort of say he he did this he did that and they're thinking oh is this the chap the guy from the previous chapter or whatever and it's actually yeah. someone else but you, you sort of unveil it a bit later on you have to try and get the reader's imagination going a wee bit so they're picturing this yeah. scene in their head and then all of a sudden it turns on its head 
and things aren't quite yeah. the same. I, I quite like that. Uh, but it's hard to do well. So that, like, that, well, I, is, I thought that I did was... that quite well, and it's stuck in my head this whole time. I think I put that out in twenty fifteen. It's good. It's good because it's light. You know, it's light hearted, yeah. but it's it starts with action. You think, oh, this is great. You know, so a bit of fight, action here, and but it's not a real it's fight. Just, uh, yeah, that's good. Good, good, good stuff. So um, I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about the book that I've chosen, and this hasn't got a prologue. Um, but just while we're on the subject of prologues. Now, we've talked about prologues quite a lot. Are you of the opinion, then, that a reader can just not read a prologue if there is a prologue? I think a reader can do whatever they like. Well, obviously, obviously, a reader can do whatever they like. They've bought the book. They can choose. But do you think that it's... I guess what I'm saying is, do you think that prologues are written to be thrown away, like as a, as a throwaway no. item? Because I know some people don't read them, and I find it really strange, because I think if somebody's written it, it's part of the story and it needs to be read. But. Uh, I don't really know. I think everybody's different. As you say, some people just skip them and that's up to them. If, that, if they enjoy the book better, they, they probably started reading the prologue but, and found it boring. But but if they skip them by a matter of course, as a matter of course, it just makes me wonder why just not call it chapter one, even though it's got nothing to do with the rest of the story, because if you want them to read it, you know, if that's but what... But that's up to the reader. And it's, uh, I mean, it's... When you come to the end, but it's up to the writer to decide to decide whether to call it a prologue or not. The pro, the, the, the writer can just call it something else. I suppose, I mean, yeah, I mean, there the, is the, an the, argument then because the prologues do tend to be less exciting than chapter one's beginning. So I suppose you you do have to wonder if they made the prologue chapter one, more people would probably just not read the book. Oh, well, maybe but I suppose that's, it's maybe more that's of an the reason, artistic thing. It's interesting because I was looking at this one, so I've chosen. Uh, the book that I've chosen is The Lords of the North by Bernard Cornwell. So you've chosen the big um, David Gemmell, the big uh, big man from um, fantasy, and I've chosen the big guy from historical fiction. And this is the third book in the Last Kingdom series. And I've not chosen it necessarily because it's my favourite of the series. I've read all the books, but to be honest, I can't remember that detailed you know about with each one but when i was looking at this one didn't have that many physical books of his on my shelves i've read you know I've, I've given some away and lost some or whatever i've got a few of them but i haven't got the very first one which i thought would have been interesting but um anyway i've got this one i looked at it and i thought it was chapter one and then i was when i was looking at it i realized actually there's no heading and chapter one starts three or four pages later so it's a prologue but not called a prologue so it's it's just a, a thing that's there. But chapter one, chapter one starts on page 10. This is page three. There's just no But well, that would make you wonder if the publisher knew that people would skip the prologue. So that's, what, I, well, that's what I'm prologue. thinking. Well, that's what I'm thinking, because it comes after a page which says um, part one, the slave king. Next page, you've just got it. It's just like yeah. the start of a chapter. So you, as a reader, you're not going to think anything. You're just going to read this. it, which is what I was doing <laughs> to do. And then well, I wonder... you're not going to go, I'm not going to. I'm not going to read the first page of this but how book. How many people that hate prologues yeah. read that, realised it was a prologue and felt cheated? <laughs> you never know. It makes me now think I'm never going to add a prologue again. If, I'm, if I want a prologue, I'm just going to not put anything. I'm just it gonna, does, just it not does make anything. you think I better avoid those. If people hate them that much, yeah. the Bernard Cornwell's publisher knows it, then better Maybe. avoid them. So I'm going to read the first couple of paragraphs here of this, of this thing, because I think it does some of the things that a first page needs to do. Um, and it's funny because it starts with darkness as well, right in the first sentence, just the same as yours. And did it mind my prologue as well? Yes, it did. It was in the shadows, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. The man stood in the shadows preparing for murder. Yeah, so you got not darkness, yeah, but, but, just, but shadows. Just let so it's me, funny. Give me a sec to check the other book. I was, uh, I don't know if it's darkness, but it's definitely at night. It's interesting that we all we all sort of go in. It was a yeah. dark and stormy night, right? So anyway, I'm going to read Bernard Cornwell, first couple of pages, first couple of para paragraphs of um, the Lords of the North, which was originally published. I will tell you because I asked you this question, so I probably should tell people for this one as well. It was published in 2005 originally, or 2006. I don't know, co copyright 2005, published by HarperCollins 2006. So that's a bit unusual. But anyway, and it makes you feel very old because I remember reading it when it first came out. Yeah. I wanted darkness. 
There was a half moon that summer night, and it kept sliding from behind the clouds to make me nervous. I wanted darkness. I had carried two leather bags to the small ridge which marked the northern boundary of my estate. My estate, Fivhaden, it was called, and it was King Alfred's reward for the service I had done him at Ethendon, where, on the long green hill, we had destroyed a Danish army. It had been shield wall against shield wall, and at its end, Alfred was king again, and the Danes were beaten, and Wessex lived, and I dare say that I had done more than most men. My woman had died, my friend had died, I had taken a spear thrust in my right thigh, and my reward was Fivhaden. And then he goes on to talk about Fivhaden being five hides and blah, blah, blah. Um, it actually if you, it carries on and it, it kind of leaves you asking questions of what's next, you know, what's he doing with these two bags? But I suppose even so, in these right at the beginning, you're asking the question, why is he, what's he doing with Have these two bags? What, what's, he sets the scene, he gives a little bit of the, of, I mean, Bernard Corn was quite good at rolling out what's happened in the past quickly at the beginning of a yeah, book it's always hard to get that the reader is, situated hard, isn't it? especially if you've got a long series it is. how do you fit this in without you know show don't and tell kind of thing how do you tell people that this happened and exactly so i mean he's, he's done master, it there yeah. you know, he trots off a few things i mean he's a master isn't he so he, he you know utred you know we're assuming it's in utred's voice because all the books yeah. are in first person aren't they so you kind of know that but you know straight away he has him in a place i think he's doing some of the things that we said that, that i think you have to do He's setting the scene straight away. We know it's in the past, and we straight away start talking about um, King Alfred, Ethendon, Danish army. So if you didn't know, if by any stretch of the imagination, you didn't know it was about Vikings and where it was, you kind of start situating yourself, you know, King Alfred and Wessex. And, you know, so you're getting these ideas and you have this question of what, why does he want darkness? What's he doing with these two bags? What's and, in those bags? You know, I'd carried what's in the bags. What yeah, is in those so bags, I Matthew? I must know. Well, I think I think um, that it's treasure yeah, that it he decides to it's bury. It's not heads, yeah, or or it's parts. not heads. But I did wonder when I was reading it as well. I was thinking, <laughs> what is this? And he goes on a bit, and he and he gives he gives some more introduction. But I don't really see why it's a. I mean, it's not really a prologue. You see, it's action with the main character, so you can't really call it a prologue. But I don't know why it's not called chapter one. I'm guessing chapter one jumps, you know, a bit in time. Yeah, or something. but maybe there's slightly more but, um, action, a fight scene or something. Well, tell us then. Maybe, maybe. Yep. So I'll tell you. So chapter one starts with Thorkild let the boat drift downstream a hundred paces, then rammed her bows into the bank close to a willow. He jumped ashore, tied a seal hide line to tether the boat to the willow's trunk, and then, with a fearful glance at the armed men watching from higher up the bank, scrambled hurriedly back on board. You, he pointed at me, find out what's happening. Trouble's happening, I said. You need to know more? I need to know what's happened to my storehouse, he said, then nodded towards the armed men. And I don't want to ask them, so you can instead. So straight away, I guess it is more action-based. He's throwing Uhtred. I think I prefer the prologue too, or the, the first page, mystery. the first lines. There's, more, there's definitely yeah. more mystery. I think that's one of the things um, that is, is very useful, I think, in a, in a first lines of a book, is the mystery. If you've got something that the readers don't know, in fact, I think one of the driving... Um, forces behind a good genre fiction, commercial fiction, the sort of thing that we write, is that drive of asking questions and having people not know the answers they want. Whether it's a small question, like is the person going to get punched in the face, or you know, did they get what's knocked out? Did they survive bag? the fight, or whatever? Or what's in the leather bag? What, yeah, you know, anything. What's behind the door? What, whatever. All those things make you want to turn the page. And um, so I think the mystery is there. Although, you know, ending those first couple of paragraphs, you're left with the mystery of, you know, I want to know, know is you know, obviously Uhtred's going to have to approach these guys. Are they going to kick his head in? Is he going to kill someone? Is, is there going to be a fight? What's happened to the store building that it sounds like it's been destroyed or whatever? But so, you know, there's definitely mystery there, but it's not it's not as mysterious as that and, and sort of enigmatic, I guess, as that opening um, few lines. But interestingly enough, I mean, none of those lines of, of the Bernard Cormor book have got real sort of yeah, full-on no action early fight, on. Yeah. You know, they're, they're kind of yeah. setting the, the scene. So I suppose if you're confident enough, you can do that. You don't have to have like a big punch up right at the beginning. You can. Uh, build, it might have been interesting yeah. if you did have the first book in the series. Maybe that one started like that. And by the time you come to the third, you kind of you know your readers yeah, will maybe. probably be there anyway. 
Yeah. I, mean, I think, yeah, I think Bernard Cornwall probably knows that his readers are going to be we'll with him. We'll all be there, exactly. We'll yep. all be there, yeah. And what a nice Every place historical to be. Well done, author Bernard. In the world, basically. We'll be yeah. reading his book. Yeah. Yeah, every every other every other historical fiction author. Exactly. Yeah, we'll and, all be and reading these new books. All the authors will all be reading, going, "Damn him, him. he's yeah. too good." <laughs> <laughs> no, we all love him. He's like he's like our. I mean, I've never met the man, but I'm sure he always comes yeah, across. He really lovely, does. So yeah. maybe one maybe one day we'll get him on the. Um, that would be good podcast. actually. He, he replied to me once when I emailed him. I was doing something for the Historical Novel Society about weapons, actually. Which might have fitted in better than the last episode. But of all the people I contacted, some of them never bothered replying, but Bernard Cornwell did. And go. he wrote a wee piece for us, uh, but never got published. But I thought it was really nice of him that he took the time to actually do it. Yeah, he seems he seems lovely. Um I've I've contacted him before as well about reading. Actually, the time when I sent you my manuscript and asked for a quote, I, I did contact him as well. And I did get a response, not not from him directly, but from his assistant, right. and said, you know, send the manuscript, and I'll you know see what we can do. And so, so you it, was, it wasn't a total brush off of the scene. I did, yeah, you and yeah. Bernard, yeah, yeah. But I can be forever thankful that at you. Least, at least I gave you a line then. <laughs> you did give me a line, and so did some other nice people, and I'm sure. I'm sure Bernard read it, and he, and he he probably thought, "I can't, I can't give this guy an endorsement because too he's going to do me out of oh, house and home. Oh, he's too good." Steal yeah, all his too readers. Good. Yeah, he was he was terrified. So no, I'm I'm only joking, Bernard. <laughs> and I don't hold uh, hold I hold no grudge. So um, so interesting things here. Just just before we go on to our own books, we're going to talk about our own um our own books and which uh you know what. A couple of lines we've got i know we've talked a, bit, a little bit about our own books already but we've got the books that we'd chosen originally to talk about um but there's some tips here from a from a web page called the right practice and that's w-r-i-t-e the right practice.com um and i didn't i've not copied the whole uh, web page they've got lots of information about this but their sort of top level tips um that they had were were skip the prologue this is for Good opening idea. pages um which which is interesting you know so they say skip the prologue um and i think you know both you and me have included prologues um as we've said and we've had a long conversation about that so there's a question mark there but they say skip it create tension in the first page in the first couple of pages which i think we've talked about too reveal the core of your character and your book and they, there's a quote here from their page which says, you never have a second chance to make a first impression. And the average reader makes up their mind in seconds. The first page should also, um, on some level, raise, point to, or set up the overall question your novel is answering. So I think that's, we've kind of talked about that. And I think, thinking back to my own thing, like The Serpent Sword, definitely does that you know you're setting up the question of who's been murdered and what's going on that's right from the beginning and there's a sword mentioned he finds that, that later on in the prologue he picks up a, a, the sword and he's obviously murdered this guy for for the sword um so there's kind of the mystery there and um you know the first few lines hopefully draw you in and then you've got this um you know, ground your reader as well and i think we've been talking about setting the scene and making people feel really part of that world and understanding where they are which i think is really important because one of the things you're doing in any novel is kind of transporting the reader but in historical fiction Especially, more so yeah you you really need to sort of make them feel that they're grounded in a world that exists but that, that they feel that you know what you're talking about and they understand how it how it works and, and what they're seeing um so they say here that, you know the reader should have a solid idea about the setting right away you know where are the characters what's the time period which season are we in so all of those sort of things um and there's some other tips here from a from for starting a novel which is from a, another website called nownovel.com they say begin a novel by making your reader need answers which we've talked about begin with settings that convey tone and mood we've also talked about that start a novel with interesting dialogue which you yeah, definitely like did that. with yours even a chapter to yeah. start a chapter with dialogue i think is quite exciting it's very yeah. immediate isn't it gets it, it gets people in into the yeah like you said you know oh i'm uh, done for but you can have it in, you know often I, I do quite often start with people like look you know with an yeah. expletive yeah. You know, but but use cock or something. People are like you know, he he screamed, you know, or whatever. Then, then he's angry about something, but you don't know what he's angry about. That is the way you talk in real life. 
It is, but it's used. You go to the shop and you're overcharged. By Woden's bones, how dare you! Three shillings and four pennies. I will pay no more. The wench? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> that's me in the pub. <laughs> that's you cancelled. Um, that's, that's me cancelled. No, it's it's the it's the, the local the local guy is surname's <laughs> wench. Yeah, Bill Wench. He's related to the um to the drummer Bill Bruford. <laughs> <laughs> He's called Bill Bill Wench. Bob Wench, maybe. Anyway, uh, so more 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 of these points from nownovel.com. Launch right into gripping action, which we've talked about as well. Introduce strong character motivations and goals. Boom. Foreshadow future tensions and uncertainties. Write a teasing opening line, which is definitely something I really like to do with that. Um, you know, he's the, the, the guy's waiting in the shadows preparing for murder. Um and craft curious first chapter ending. So that's an interesting we haven't talked about is like how do you end that first chapter? But basically, if you can create some sort of cliffhanger. Yeah, we can maybe yes. do that next time or another time, even just a short yeah. segment and chapter endings, because that is something I've yeah. never learned uh, from my editor. Yeah, and that's that's really important, actually. It's something that I, I've learned. Well, let's talk about that another time. Yeah, we're doing beginnings today. Let's let's put that aside. We'll right after this podcast we need to have this episode we need to jot down these ideas because they're good um but yeah so i was thinking about something else oh yeah i was just going to say that we'll stick all these um the links all these uh, the show notes. Uh, website urls yeah the links we'll put them into the show notes yeah so Stephen, what is your second choice which is a book of your own writing what have you chosen for us i have chosen lucia a roman lucia. slave's tale the one that I inspired. Yes, uh, well, it's funnily enough because I think your choice uh, inspired this. I hadn't yeah. read it. You just mentioned that you were yeah. writing a standalone novel, and I'd been listening to audible versions of Jane Eyre, Rebecca, and Wuthering Heights, and I thought, but well, they're all standalone classics. Maybe I could do something like that. And you'd told me you were writing yours, so. I decided to write this about a Roman slave girl, and guess what? There's a prologue. Okay, well, read, are you going to read from the prologue? Yes. Go on then. So here we go. It was a terrible smell that woke her. The acrid stench of burning penetrated her sleeping mind, and she awoke with a start, gasping for breath. Confusion, panic, fear, all threatened to overcome her as she realised her bedchamber was filled with smoke and the village outside clamoured with raised voices. They echoed her own terror, but they were also filled with desperation and anger, and hearing them, the girl finally came to full wakefulness, noting the clang and clatter of weapons meeting in battle. She coughed and fell onto her knees to escape the smoke, dragging the thick woolen cloak from the floor beside her bed and pulling it on, wondering where her parents were. The sounds of fighting were closer now, a loud crack came from the room adjoining her bedchamber, suggesting the roof there had collapsed, and she knew there was no option but to get out into the night with the battle raged. Who was fighting? So, it's, again, very action, action-packed action there. Yeah, I'm not, so I've not read Lucia. Maybe I should. It well, sounds why good. Not? What is wrong with you? Oh, well, it's like it, 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 it's taken me as long as it takes you to read one of my books. It's, <laughs> Fair enough. So, <laughs> so I will one day maybe I'll read it. It's an audio, isn't it? It's, it's an audible. Maybe I'll. Yes. Yeah, um, so, so, well, see, this is one that uh, was not self-published. Audible bought this one, and it's proofread and proof edited and all the rest of it. But actually, reading it back now, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. It's that's actually, good. Yeah, that it's very, good. very good. It, you, sometimes, as an author, you read things back and you go, "Did I write that? That's excellent." Uh, that's, that's really good, and it's um, and and it it does all the things. So don't skip the prologue. The, it's a good prologue. I don't know whether it needs to be called a prologue or just chapter one. I'm guessing that happens early and then later. Yeah, exactly. The rest chapter one starts once she's a slave. So this is how she's. This one's just captured. Ends up a slave. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah. it's a very distinct definition. But you're doing all of the things. You know, you're creating tension. You're asking. We're asking the questions. What's happening? There's action. So you're ticking lots of the boxes of these points that were raised yeah. um, by these different websites that we've already talked about. Um, and I, th I think it's really good. It's great. I mean, the, I, I suppose the only thing 
that we don't get from that those few lines is we don't know the period we don't know it's roman yeah that's you do true. know it's you do know it's set in the past though because there's you said a like, clash of swords yeah the clang and clatter of weapons so i guess that it, but i suppose edwin buying the book it's called a roman slave's tale <laughs> well there you go so, yeah so you know that yeah gonna have yeah. an idea anyway but i mean the other books don't say you know specifically which yes, place but, they're in either i mean it's difficult you know to throw that into into the, so I think it feels very grounded. It feels like you know what you're talking about and you know where you are and you have a good idea of the character. And I think it drags you into the scene with the smell and yeah, yeah, absolutely. the noises and stuff. And she's just coming awake. And she's a child, obviously, because she's going, where are my parents? What's happening? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm quite proud of that. Yeah, it's quite terrifying as well. And to think that, yeah. you know, so many people throughout history have been enslaved. And obviously we write about periods in history um so you know this is a serious serious matter now we're always sort of quite joking but but you know the, we write a period of history when slavery was endemic and it was understood to be normal and if you got captured in battle you became a slave and that was it you know and yeah and you were treated terribly like and uh, yeah and not treated, terribly as in modern standards yeah really proper terribly, terribly. You yeah know, proper you terribly. your eyes poked out with a knife because you farted too loud or something next <laughs> to your master yeah, I mean, awful stuff. And yeah, but but then but then you know you think about that there was slavery was common. I mean, it's probably still a place in the world where there are slaves still. You know, we still modern slavery. But but if you go back even you know two hundred years, slavery was still commonplace throughout Normal. the world yeah. and and through through much of the world. And people being treated absolutely abominably, you know, terribly. And it's just a very strange thing. But really, I mean, if you look at the history of humankind, I mean, slavery has been a thing all the way through until about you know a couple hundred years ago when it became started to become a a, a, a point of contention that you know got got um in, in different countries and i you know britain was you know part of that movement to probably more slavery, expensive but... now to keep a slave than a machine <laughs> just one reason probably maybe, why maybe. why it's died out probably the, that's probably why britain were so at the forefront of um of a of this abolishment of slaves they probably thought the industrial revolution came to britain yeah. first so maybe they thought oh we don't need them now. don't need them why Terri pay for their food terror terrible, terrible. that's um that's a terrible slant on it all but yes very possible well we can move on to the the book that inspired lucia yeah, well yeah my only so far my only standalone novel uh, which is Wolf of Wessex, which again is um, set in the early medieval, but it's the book that's set latest so far of all the books that I've written, set in 838, although that isn't clear from the opening couple of paragraphs. But um, here they are, Wolf of Wessex. This is the one with the, if you listen to the previous podcast about weapons um, and food, but um, the, in the weapon conversation, I talked about the big axe that was on the on the cover. So anyone who's read it or sees it, um, that's the axe. Um, okay, and it's chapter one, no prologue. It had been a good morning until Dunstan found the corpse. When he'd left the hut, there had been nothing to suggest the grisly secret that was hiding deep within the forest. The weather was fine. A misty haze lingered in the folds of the land and along the winding course of the river Frammer. There was a crisp bite in the air, but Dunstan knew from the experience of many years that the mist would burn off as the sun climbed into the summer sky. Sparrows scattered, bursting forth from the bracken as Odin, Dunstan's rangy merle hound, sped off into the undergrowth. To see the dog run away lifted Dunstan's spirits. The dog was close to seven years old, but seemed to think it was still a pup. Such was its vigor and energy. Dunstan stretched his right leg and grimaced. Straightening, he winced as his back popped and cracked. Sorry. Nice. Nice. Evocative of Dunstan and his complaints and ailments, which well, some you've people got the, like to complain about. Just certain words that draw you and he found a corpse. Yeah. That's the first, I mean, the first line, I think one of the things, you know, say have a, have a gripping first line. There's something I really try to, I try to do. Most of my books have a first line or two that, really tries to grip you but just a certain word that might catch you corpse is obviously a word that catches your eye and your imagination yeah. and a uh, secret yeah you know your imagination's starting to work straight away a corpse a secret and then you describe the weather how nice it is so you've mm. got the setting in your head there's a secret there's a oh wait a minute a corpse as well so it's all building up 
and then his back snapping and popping as well. So all sorts of stuff. So you see, so you know a bit about the character as well. You start knowing. I mean, literally after that, of course, it describes the fact that he wishes he was as young as the dog and that he could still run around. You know, he feels a bit old. So you know straight away in the first couple of pages that Dunstan's not a young man. He's found a dead body. It's a nice day. He's kind of that's you know, the the dark secret, grisly secret that he finds. It's and that really is the thrust of the whole book, right? It's all it's all down to that. Yeah, grisly murder. He finds a dead body, and then he's trying to kind of find out what happened, and then later on rescue the look after the daughter of the man who's been killed. Um, and that all becomes quite clear early, very early on. And basically, the whole book then is just the rush to sort of go. Then, well, trying to escape from the baddies and and get justice for the girl and get her protected. And so. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that. I think it does, you know, it does the job. And I think the, those first few lines really pull people in. And I think it worked. And um, so, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, along with the cover, with your axe, and your the great, forest. The it great basically axe. basically sets everything up very nice. And the dog, which uh, is based on your own dog. He's modelled on um, on Blue, who at the time was only about four or five months old when I started writing this. Or actually, when I wrote this, he was he was only a few, six months old, I think, when I finished this book. Um but yeah, it's sort of based on the look of Blue, who is Merle coloured. Um, but Odin, of course, is like a big sort of wolfhound sort of size. He's massive. He's big and strong. And so it's nothing to do with Led Zeppelin then? No. No? Why? No companion like a blue-eyed Merle? No. I've sure never known. Brony, Brony or Stomp. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know. The whole song is uh, about Robert Plant's dog. I did not know. Yeah. Now, well, now I've got to listen to it. I know the song, but I never listen to the lyrics. Obviously, I usually sing it. But uh, me and my pal, when we go to the studio, he plays ah, it on the acoustic, and uh, you can. It's quite a good song to play on the acoustic and sing along to. So there's your okay. wee bit of rock for the. We could do. We could week. do the. We could do the immigrant song. I hear. Ah! <laughs> I can do that. But I can do the. <laughs> you can do that. I'll do the rest. That's the best bit of the immigrant song. <laughs> yeah, the Viking prove. Viking yeah. song there. I. Yeah, so we can do that. No, I never. So that's that's a great thing. The mill dog. So anyone who doesn't yeah, I thought know maybe it, it, it tied into the book. No, no, you never knew about it. I didn't know about it. No, so it's just yeah. because the blue actually is like a, a blue mill. So he's he's got that sort of black and grey and, and white sort of mottled um, right. coat. So yeah, and the old man, of course, is me. So that's except it. Except he's younger. Except he, <laughs> except he's younger. So. Um, I think that probably is enough for today's episode. I think we talked a lot about um, about starting books, and um, you know, if people want to leave us comments and tell us about some great um, great books, you know, message us and all the different ways that are possible to message us and uh, recommend some books that have a good start, so we yeah. can learn from them, uh, rip them off, maybe. <laughs> well, hopefully, not rip them off, but yeah, <laughs> we can always learn. So yeah, if people have got some great ideas, that would be brilliant. I think it's time to bring matters to the close. So I'm going to ask you very quickly, um, what have you been reading recently? I've been reading this book called The Time for Swords. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. But, uh, it's okay, actually. Yeah. Quite, enjoy quite enjoying it. I just don't have time enough to read. But yes, yeah, again, by Matthew Harvey. It's uh, A Time for Swords. So yeah, I'm still trying to get through that. I just do not have enough time well hopefully by the next episode you'll have finished you'll have finished that because it's um it's, it's a very good, good book yeah it's a, actually a very good book joking aside it's a good book <laughs> i like the short chapters punchy short sentences and it's exciting i just need more time yeah yeah so um so i've been reading um sharp's gold which is bernard cornwell's second sharp novel that he published um somebody a mate of mine gave me basically all the sharp novels recently so I decided I owed it to myself to read them. I think I've read some of them in the past, but I can't remember which ones because they're all, let's face it, they're all quite yeah, similar. similar. And yeah. they, so I decided to start reading some. And they're great. It's great. So inspiration for just how to write gripping, yeah. fast action adventure historical He's fiction. a master. So great. And in the nonfiction front, I'm reading, um, I have been reading a book called Pilgrimage to Rome in the Middle Ages by Deborah J. Birch. So that can give a bit of a clue about um, what I might be um, mm. doing. Cowboys and ancient Rome. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> medieval Rome, Middle Ages. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Interesting so, project for you then. 
yeah so you have to you have to read some more of um, of my books to see what's happening there um what have you what have you been listening to i've been enjoying slash's recent album very good i even bought a signature slash uh les paul guitar I enjoyed his album that much so if you like guns and roses you should give slash and his new band a try the album's just called four the number four so give that a go if you like good hard rock music sounds good what about you, Matthew? What have you been listening to? I've been listening to, well, just very recently, I've been listening to podcast The Rock on Tours, which I know you listen to. Oh, yeah, um, I've that, enjoyed some of those. It's quite interesting listening to them mention bands and talk to different people that I wouldn't yeah. normally listen to. And I listened to one of the old ones, and it's with um, Noel Gallagher and um, talking about Oasis. And so I decided to give definitely maybe um, a, a, another chance because I it passed me by in the 90s. Yeah. I hated it, and I listened to it again now, and... I kind of realised why I never got into it because it just all sounds the same. And it just uh, sounds, well, yeah, it's just, quite simplistic. Know. But what's the story? Morning Glory is a good album. I listened to that afterwards and I thought, yeah, this is better. But yeah, still. some good stuff on there. I think that's it for um, today's episode. It's been pretty interesting, and I'm, I'm, I've I've learnt some things. And I've, I now I know I want to read Lucia more than more than before because I like that introduction. It's, well, I've um, read Wolf of Wessex. It's only fair. It is. It is definitely only fair. So I'll do that and uh, I'll maybe pick it up on Audible and see. Yeah, it's very well read, actually. Uh, Imogen Church did a great job. Okay, great. Actually, I think I've got a, an Audible credit, so I'll do that. So I think that's the end of well, the show. Well, just before we wrap up, I wanted to let you know again about our giveaway. So we hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. And if you are, would like to support us, please tell your friends. Spread the word by sharing our pages on Facebook and Twitter. And if possible, leave a review wherever you're listening to us. If you do any or all of these things, tag us in them or send us a message or email to let us know you've done it and we'll put your name in a hat to win a signed book of your choice from each of us. So the giveaway will close at the end of July this year, which is 2022. So please get in touch before then so we can put you into the draw. Great. And that's it for today's episode. So we hope you've enjoyed it. Please let us know if you have any questions or things you'd like us to cover in future episodes. You can contact us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash rock, paper, swords podcast on Twitter, where we are at rock underscore swords and both Stephen and myself are on Twitter as well. So you can find us on there um, and links to our Twitter um, handles and all of our books and all the information you can want about us on our websites and uh, that's matthewharfey.com and stephenamackay.com. The theme music is written and performed and copyright by us. So until next time, a rock, paper, swords, it's goodbye from me, Matthew Harfey. Well, it's goodbye from me, Stephen A. Mackay. And remember, whatever action and adventure you have going on in your life, be kind, stay safe, and happy reading. <laughs>